Howdy, Leadership Scholars. Welcome back and welcome to our first subsection of forming. So why I wanted to start with talking about understanding a little bit more about team composition and what makes a team successful is the fact that as you are forming, and especially if you are assigned a leadership role within the team, and now that you have the burden of knowledge on how a good team truly works, these are things that you need to keep in mind. As you are developing that team, as you are forming a team, as you are thinking about what is that next step in the team development process. So when you're thinking about how is this actually going to work, I want you to think back to that first reflection and really think about what, how did I define a successful team? How did I define a unsuccessful team? Um, what is a perfect team to me? And is my idea matches with the literature? Because it may not, it may be a little different based on that contextualization. So let's get started. First, I wanna kinda of hit some different types of teams. Now, depending on where you look, you're gonna find a list of a kajillion. And sometimes it's very, um, I wanna say, not necessarily practical, because they're all practical. Um, but some are more descriptive or less descriptive. Some are broad, like is it a in-person or a hybrid or a virtual team? You know, so to me, that's more of a place that's not exactly describing what the team does. Um, so you kind of have to look and find what works best. For us, I thought the best list of definitions comes from Sundrum in 1999 looking at six different types of work teams, and these are all based on the actual functions that they perform. So the first one is a production team. So this could be a factory team, um, something that manufactures or assembles products on a repetitive basis. Um, a production team is a team that works together to complete the same task over and over and over. So even though the example that Sundstrom gives is more, I think, physical, I think this could be cerebral too. As I was thinking through this, um, you know, if you've ever had to grade portfolios, uh, I was in charge of internships, oh goodness, 20 plus years ago um, for our department. And we, it was a team of us that kind of supervised all the internships and they had to hit certain things on their, uh, their reflection project, which was kind of different for everyone, but they had to hit these certain things. So we had rubrics, right, to judge these projects and we did it as an assembly line. So I judged, you know, let's say the introduction and someone else judged the leadership uh, identification and someone else judged the applicability and someone else judged. And so we just kind of went along a production line grading these different portfolios to see if they had what they need to have in them. And I also think about, you know, my poor TAs in like my ethics class for my undergrads they are having to grade, you know, 25 to 30 case studies and the case studies all look different, but the rubric is the same. And so even though the answers may look a little different, they're all trying to get to the same thing. So that to me, that's a very repetitive type of a, uh, of a program. So, but you have to work together in order to get it done. I don't know. I don't know. Something to think about. The next one is service teams. So when we think about a service team, sometimes we think about a maintenance crew or food services, uh, retail maybe, but these are people that conduct repeated transactions with others. So this is actually kind of broad. So do you have a team that works together on customer service? Do you have a team that works together with, I think about, um, probably because you know it's summertime and we see new student conferences walking around. Uh, these new student conferences, that team that develops the programming and then puts the programming into place, they are a team, right? And they are every day in, in and out working with brand new Aggies and their 
families. And so it was, it's very much service oriented. How can we help you? What can we do? Do you have any questions? And it is a, again, repeated transaction with other people. So that could be an example of service team that maybe doesn't have to be like Burger King. Management team. Um, these are composed of people that are probably, you know, mid-level managers and above. So not people that are, you know, lowly like professors. Um, so this is like department heads and above in higher education, but they plan, they develop policy, they coordinate the activities within the organization. So that's their role and their goal is how do we make the organization better, more successful, um, how do we deliver the goods we need to deliver, whatever those goods may be. So that is the function of a management team. Then we have project teams. So these are usually short term. They bring together experts from people all across the organization and they perform a specific task. So we need a project team to complete this one thing. And we know we need to have a cross-pollination of people, so we're gonna put them all together, and it's gonna be just for, usually, again, that short, defined period, and then that project team stops, and they work on something new. So in higher ed, I think about grants, um, and grant teams, it's interesting to watch people work together, especially if you get a social science group and a bench science group together working on, at, on a project as a team. You know, everyone has their specific role within how are we going to make this grant work. And that grant has a defined timeline, right? So three years, let's say. And so after that three years, that team stops working together. They could pick up another project later on if they were a cohesive team, but if they weren't, they're like, yep, got my grant money. I got it on my Vita. I'm out. So um, it could be individualized. Now, an action or performance team, I love to think about these as sports teams or a traveling theater group, you know, working on a play or a musical together, um, or a, a surgery team even. I know some of you guys are in healthcare. Um, so this is brief performances that are repeated under a new condition and require specialized skills and extensive training or preparation. So why it is a, a repeat action, but in very different, different circumstances. Um, so let's talk about like a theater production. You're going to say the same lines every night, but if you're a traveling theater troupe, you're going to be in a different theater you're gonna be in a different city. You're not quite sure what you're gonna be uh, in for, right? And so you've gotta change your strategy and sometimes your performance based on that different environment. Or a sports team, right? We love to say people hate coming to Kyle Field because the Aggies are loud and it's hard to hear. They have to change their plan, their group, um, plan in order to come into Kyle Field because they may not be able to run um, audibles anymore. So they may have to come up with a different signal to let people know what that play is. But all of these teams have specialized skill. So it doesn't matter where it is, they can still do their job. They just have to modify it and work together in order to do that. And then a parallel team are temporary teams that operate outside of normal work. So this is to me, normal work. Um, oh, I mean, I'm not a HR um, specialist, but you know that whole like other duties as deemed responsible thing in your contract? Um, this makes parallel teams really hard to define because so many things we're asked to do is outside of our actual scope of work, but it's service, you know, especially working in a land grant, right? Working on committees, doing things like that. That is a outside of normal work. It's not teaching research or uh, engaging in, in grants. And so that those are the kind of above and beyond things that are asked by your organization. I was reading an article that talked about um, there was a, a group of, of people within an organization that realized that not many people knew about investing. And their um, 
was starting to kind of dip a little bit. So they wanted to help people so that, honestly, it was a thing about generations and it was the, the Gen Xers and the millennials just want the baby boomers to freaking retire. And so they came up with a team that would help the baby boomers understand the stock market better so they could invest some of their money better so they could have a bigger nest egg so they could retire faster and this is something they did on their own time and so that would be a parallel team does that make sense so when we talk about these different types of teams in forming specifically is if you are asked to put together a team you've got to figure out what kind of team do i actually need because based on that, you're going to choose different members, which we'll talk about in a second, that make that team be able to be successful. But you would never ask a parallel team to be a service team, right? Because parallel is temporary and it happens outside of work hours. There's no way they can do the same thing that a service team that works with people eight to five every day. That's a different skill set that's asking different things. So that's why I wanted to include this is for you to think about what type of team do I need as you start pulling people together. So looking at this idea of team success, how do we define success? Oh boy. Oh, I, you know, I, I tell people all the time when I do leadership trainings, um, the word leadership, the word ethics, uh, so many definitions, right? So if you Google what is the definition of success, I wonder how many billion hits you're going to get. Last time I did leadership, I think it was like four billion different definitions of what leadership is. So success is, you know, some people say it's like the wind. You can you can see it. You know it when you see it, um, but it's hard to, to define, describe. Um, that could be beauty. Heck, I mean, it could be so many things, right, that mean so many different things to other people. So when the academician said, how do we define team success? What does that mean? They came up with three specific things that the leader of the organization needs to keep into account when they are going to say, did we actually, were we actually successful in this team endeavor? So the first one is talking about completing the task. So did they do the thing? We'll talk obviously more extensively about these in a second. Did they maintain social relations or did they burn it to the ground? Um, I don't know if you've ever been in a team that you got the task completed, but you walked away and you hated each other. Okay, that's not team success, right? You've got to have both. And then I love this one because I think this one is overlooked quite a bit as well, is that you have to make sure that the team was worth it. Did it give its members anything? Did it give it give them more personal or professional development? Did it fill their bucket in any way? So let's kind of dive into these a little bit more. So successful completing of the task. This is when a task is not only completed, but it's done better than if an, an individual would have done it themselves. So it's only successful if the outcome is better than anything that one person could have done. No man is an island, right? There are hardly any, I'm not going to say none because none is pretty definitive, but there are hardly any innovative um, inventions or things that have improved our lives that have just come solely from one person, right? Every Steve Jobs needs a Steve Wozniak. Um, you've got to kind of have a yin and a yang. You need those diverse perspectives. And so it's, um, unless it just all completely falls apart, um, most of the time this one will be, I guess, fulfilled. Because you're going to look and see, were the objectives or the goals actually met? So when we talk about this is something that is done a priori, if you're a fun stat nerd, um, you do it in the forming stage. You talk about those objectives and those goals before you get too far down the road. So then are they met? Did they have to change? It's okay if the goals and the objectives had to change once you got into the, the thick of it. Um, but was that a continuous process? Did the team actually work together, have that intellectual diversity to solve problems to complete the task together? Or was it just one person doing the job and the rest of the, the people just being their, their grunts, right? Their minions. 
that's not a true successful team. So did everyone contribute in their own special way, basically? And were the deliverables actually quality? So it's one thing just to complete a project, but to really complete it and do it well. Um, so some of you I know are kind of in your last stages of your thesis or your, or your dissertation. This is one of the last courses you're taking. Um, I have a, a colleague actually over in, uh, in education who uh, tells her students all the time that a good dissertation is a done dissertation. And I love that. Um, but there are metrics, right, to that task, even though it's an individual project. There's a, there's a lot of teamwork that comes on with a, with a thesis and a dissertation, especially if you have a, a good committee. But it's that idea of not just done, but done to the standard that the team decided it to be, right? It's very cool. Next, let's talk about maintaining social relations. So what does team success look like when we're talking about maintaining social relations? So this is when the team develops and maintains their social relations. They stay cohesive and they are a viable group to move forward together in a future task. So like I said before, you don't walk away hating each other. You walk away saying, hey, that was a really good experience. Um, I've learned a lot. I think I could do this again. I think I could work with you people again. Um, looking kind of through these, I love the fact my husband has a grant team that he has worked with from uh, Auburn and University of Florida, University of Tennessee. Sometimes they bring in people from other universities to kind of be part of their team. It's almost like an audition process, I think. Um, they brought in Georgia one time, they brought in Ohio State, they brought in some different people. But they are a cohesive group that work really well together. They all have very different um, I would say interpersonal skills, <laughs> um, you know, because there's no such thing as a normal faculty member. Um, but they have the, the capability to work together. And if someone doesn't have that skill set, someone else does. And they have worked together enough and been successful in receiving and, and administering grants um, that they, they're they really like a little family. It's very cool to watch from the outside if you're a team development nerd like I am, but they really are this great cohesive team that has gone on. And like I said, they perpetually, every time they apply for a grant, I swear they get it. There may be a tinge of jealousy there in my, in my voice, but it's very cool that their social relations, they hang out with each other outside of work. You know, when they go to conferences, they're going to go find something cool to do. Uh, they went to a professional conference together. Several of them were there, and they found a minor league baseball team that was close. You know, and they all went to the minor league game together just to hang out. It's things like that that help maintain those social relations. Um, and so can they, do you communicate well? Do you trust people? We're going to talk a lot about that and storming. So have you gone through the storming stage? You've walked out, you've normed, you've performed, you've adjourned, you've, you've celebrated together, and you want to work together again. The last one is promoting members' personal and professional development. So a successful team develops an individual's task and interpersonal skills. So a great team does all these things. They, a great team says, you know what? I walked away and I'm able to may not, I may not agree with everything my teammates said, but at least I'll listen, right? I don't have to agree with you, but I do have to listen. I have to entertain that thought. We need to have actually productive dialogue. And that productive dialogue helps for the task part and the relationship part. Um, did working on this team actually further this person's career? So the end results of the product, that task um, product, did it help them? Did it help them build their vita? Did it help the organization? Did it help from upper management to see that these people could do this specific task? Did it lead to other opportunities in training and development? If so, then the team was successful. And then on that kind of flip side coin of relationship, did working in the team increase social and emotional growth? 
which I think it's really great when we think about that. Did they not walk away burnt out and just feeling like I'm just, I'm out, I'm done. I don't want to deal with this anymore. Or did they say, you know what, I, I learned to deal with conflict. I worked with people that I'd never worked with before and I grew from that. So if task and relationship, but also the culmination, so it's like one plus two and equals three, did all three of those things work together? And if so, if, if you can walk away from a team and say, yeah, absolutely, I increased my knowledge on the task, we did a really great job on that project, I learned how to work with people, um, I learned a lot about myself, and I want to work with these people, and, and this is how it's going to affect my career. If all of that happens, then the team was actually pretty darn successful. So looking through the literature, just kind of picking out some stuff for you guys, um, I wanted to talk through really quickly these, this idea of the four conditions for team success. So the first one is, how is the team composed? So what members basically getting, uh, again, I, I think this is the second time I've said this in this class and I'm not necessarily a fan of this, um, <laughs> this imagery. In fact, Jim Collins says it drives him crazy. This is one of the only things that people remember from his book, but getting the right people on the right seat in the bus. Um, so are you choosing people to be on the team if that's your role that have the right task, knowledge, skills, and abilities? So do they already know how to do some issue of the project? And if they don't have the right knowledge, skills, and abilities, are you putting them there for development? And do they know that? I have been on teams before that I've been placed on not knowing that the person placing me there was doing it for my growth. And so I was like, what do I have to contribute to this? Like, I'm not as smart as these people. I do not understand what's going on. I've never done this before. Why am I on this committee? And so it was really, talk about imposter syndrome, it was really, really difficult um, until that person said, hey, I want you to learn from these people and develop the knowledge, skills, and abilities. And I was like, oh, okay, right? That's my role on the team. Looking at, if you have a large organization, are all parts or divisions of the organization represented? You don't, so I'll use our department as an example. So we are Ag Leadership Education and Communications. So we have on the undergraduate um, side, we have Ag Leadership as a major, we have Ag Science, which is Ag Education as a major, and we have Ag Communications as a major. Well, then we have a whole bunch of minors. So we've got an international minor, and you can do um, youth development as a minor, and you can do extension as a minor. You can also do leadership and, and comm as a minor, but since those are majors too. Um, so that's five different things, six, six different things, right? So we actually have more than that. We have more than six different categories of faculty that have a specialization. So as a department, if we're wanting to redevelop a mission or redevelop a, a vision, you've got to have somebody from every part of the organization. You can't just have a bunch of leadership people sitting around creating a vision that doesn't talk about, oh, international. Phooey, I forgot about international. All right, that doesn't include anything from international because you've cut out a minor, you've cut out like three faculty members, and they're going to be alienated from the organization. So you've got to have a team that represents the organization in order to truly be successful. And then looking at, do members have the group process skills to function in a team? What are group process skills? Y'all, that's Tuckman, right? Do they have the ability to say, hey, this is my group member role? Do they have the ability to say, this is how I handle conflict, or this is how I want to engage in conflict resolution? Do they have those skills that we're going to be talking about from the rest of the semester? And if they don't, do you at least have a couple people that do, that understand Tuckman? You know, think about that first article that you read, that the understanding the process is almost three quarters of the issue, knowing what's coming next and knowing how you're going to work through it. Next is characteristics of the task. So what this means is, again, going back to identifying the correct type of team that you need to do the task. So in order to be successful, you've got to have the right team doing the right thing. You have to look at, is this going to be a short-term or a long-term commitment? 
you got to let your teammates know that, right? Hey, this project's going to last six months or this project's going to last three years. They're going to need to know how long will this task take. If you're working on something and you cannot see the light at the end of the tunnel, if you don't know where that tunnel ends, it is so discouraging. You also need to think about what is the level of knowledge, skills, and abilities. Or I love this idea of additive synergy, <laughs> right? So one person can has the knowledge to do this. Then the next person comes in, takes that knowledge, kicks it up a notch, and adds a little spice, right? And then someone else comes in, and they kick that up, and they add a little spice. And so all through this process, people are learning about the different knowledge, skills, and abilities needed in order to be successful at this project because someone is good at something different than someone else. And that just adds to. It's not substantive, it's additive, which is so cool. All right, third condition for team success is actually looking through that group process. Can members combine task and relationship successfully. Even though most of us are programmed to lean one way or the other in leadership and in followership, can you do both when you need to? So again, that's looking at Tuckman. Increasing commitment and communication. So that group process is decreasing conflict and social loafing. So let's talk about social loafing for a second. So social loafing is the academic term for that jerk that doesn't do anything. Isn't that great? So you can call someone a social loafer. Um, and so if a team is truly invested, if they have been empowered, we're going to talk about empowerment, but then if they've bought in to the whole process, then you are less likely to have social loafers. They're going to engage. They know that we're all going to be judged together and they want to do their part. Now, I think this is interesting, and I think that this is probably not talked about, in my opinion, nearly enough. It's looking at the organization. And I say that probably because the one of the other graduate classes I teach is leadership and ethics and organizations and organizational culture. But um, teams are absolutely more likely to be successful in orgs that have a supportive climate for teams, right? So what does that mean? Um, that is encouraging people to work together. So before we get to that whole power and authority thing, um, I worked in a department at one point that the department had decided that how to give uh, races was going to be based on a Z-score. So his Z-score had, you know, Yes, how many classes you taught and your uh, evaluations for that class, um, how many students were in that class. But when it came to the research, um, it was how many articles did you publish, um, what type of journal was it, you know, impact factor and all that. And what our people that were really great in our department in statistics figured out is that basically, because it was this ridiculous Z-score, that if you co-authored an article with someone in the department that basically is a wash because how he gave I, I forgot to tell you this part everyone's z-score then was put into a list and the top you know five people got the highest rage raise and then the next you know 10 people got you know a two percent raise or what however he figured it out so he actually discouraged teamwork and collaboration because he wanted individual results. When we talk about evaluation, he killed the climate within our department, the department. Oh, holy moly. It was so long before people started working together again. Um, it was very competitive, very cutthroat. It's like working at a car dealership. I mean, it was bad. And so that is, that will kill a team. Absolutely. Well, it, it, if it is not encouraged, if it is not supported to work together, then why do it? Because we know working in a team takes time. It is not easy. Um, and so if you're not going to be rewarded for that, why would you do it? The other thing is, and we talked a little bit about this before, does the organization actually give the group power and authority to do the thing. If not, then it's a group. If they do, then it's a team. Um, no one's going to spend the time and effort working towards a goal of the project if they're not going to be able to actually engage and enact and make change. So again, 
looking at this, does the organization give adequate resources? And this could be meeting space. Resources could be money. Um, resources could be support, uh, technical assistance. Um, I don't know, y'all. I probably, this may get taken down um, <laughs> for me just saying this. I hate Teams. I hate Microsoft Teams. I love Teams, but I hate Microsoft Teams. Um, it never works right. It is a pain in the butt. Um, if you're working with people, and it, our college has decided that they love Teams, and so if you're, but if you're working with somebody outside of our college that doesn't use Teams, like they don't have that downloaded. Our students don't have that downloaded, especially most of our students are Apple people anyway. And so it is just a giant pain. Um, and then when things go wrong, you can't ever find an IT guy to help you. Well, that doesn't encourage collaboration, right? It encourages us to get on Zoom and do it a different way. And are they sharing and giving the right information or are they holding things back? There's nothing worse than being in the middle of something and realizing that somebody's holding that information that could change everything, right? Information is power and I get that. But if the organization's not giving you the complete picture, they're doing your team a disservice. So as we're thinking about forming, this is kind of what I want you to think about for your team development plan. How are you going to diagnose what type of team that you need? How are you going to define success? How is your team going to define success? Do you have the same definition of success? That is key. So as we move forward and talk about some of the other issues in forming, start thinking about what is success? Go back to your reflection. Um, does it agree with what we talked about or is it different? Till next time.